Hi, how are you? Great to see you. Uh, I always look forward to the fall uh, summer vacation schedule and people coming and going. And the next few weeks, pretty well everybody's back, school's in, and we begin to see uh, people that we haven't seen over the summer. And it's always great. Uh, welcome those of you over at Central Abbey and East Abbey joining us this weekend. You're going to need your Bibles. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to look at four short verses at the beginning of uh, 1 Corinthians 15. So if you've got your Bibles with you, maybe just mark that and we'll get there in a, in a little bit of time. Uh, before we dive into the message, I want to give you a um, little bit of an update on some shuffling we did on our pastoral team over the summer, and we talked about these changes uh, as they progressed over the summer, but if you were away on vacation or you happened to miss the week that we made an announcement, you may have missed sort of this internal shuffle that we had on our pastoral team, and so I wanted to put these pictures in front of you and let you know some of the changes of the roles uh, that some of our pastors are, are in. So I'll go back to the spring. Uh, Pastor Thalia, who served served us for like over 12 years as leading our care team, stepped down, and we asked John Pazook over at East Abbey, would he be willing to step in and lead our care team? He said yes. Uh, so then we need someone to replace him at East Abbey, and Levi Friesen, who was graduating this summer from our MERS program, uh, a well-known commodity around here, basically grew up at Northview, has been here since I guess he was like this high, and uh, a well-loved leader is going to take that role over at East Abbey and has already started. Pastor Joshua uh, has been asked to take on a role. It's uh, a new title, but uh, a little bit of a shape on an old role that we had. But weekend teaching and worship. Everything that happens at all of our Abbotsford sites, from the time you drive onto the parking lot to grab a cup of coffee to ushers and greeters and the worship and the music and just all of the coordination that goes into our teaching team ministries and giving oversight of that. And so he is going to step into that role, which then meant Central Abbey was open. So Eric Heath, uh, his wife Andrea, they've been part of Northview for 13 years. Eric just graduated from our Immerse program as well. Uh, it, it's kind of cool how the Immerse leadership training is working. Uh, we're training up leaders and boom, they graduate and we've got jobs for them. So Eric uh, just started a couple weeks ago over at Central Abbey and so we want to let you know that if you see these guys, uh, congratulate them and support them. I, 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 I hope you pray for all of our team, uh, all of our pastoral staff, but these guys in particular as they're, they're adjusting into new roles uh, that'd be a blessing if you'd support them in that. Okay, so let's get going. Uh, every fall when we come to uh, kick off and we start back the ministry year, I find myself asking, okay, Lord, what is it that we should be talking about? Uh, typically, we will take a week in between uh, a summer series and then a fall series. We're doing the same thing this year, uh, ending Revelation 2 and 3. Next weekend, we're diving into the book of 1 Corinthians and often talking some kind of a vision, uh, mission and values, where are we headed as a church? Uh, maybe the five W's, the who, what, when, where, and why type questions. What kind of a church is this? Where are we headed? Particularly because we know over the summer, a lot of people move into town, find their way into church. And if you're new to Northview, it's a really good time for us to talk about what are we on about and who are we? And I really enjoy those kind of messages. Uh, our mission, vision, and values that... That, that the mission is clear, actually. It's not something we create. It's something Jesus gave us. It's actually Jesus' mission. Uh, he said, go and make disciples. And so we don't get to debate that. He, he gave that to us. But we ask the question, what, what are our hopes and dreams personally uh, in our own lives and for the lives of the people that we love? And then if you, you lift it up a level and say, and what hopes and dreams might we have for our city, for our province, for our nation? What is it that we want to see God doing among us? And, and those are questions that every local church should be leaning into. And how we answer those questions then uh, indicate how we are going to be doing our ministry. Uh, what will be the, the sort of the flavor of a particular local congregation? Not that it makes it better than any other congregation, just unique. What are the emphasis that you have as a local church family? What ministry values and distinctives define us? So I love those kind of conversations. Uh, I also love the when and where questions. Uh, that we live, and you hear me talk about this a lot, we live in a unique particular time and place. That's obvious, but that impacts us at every level, and I think we need to think this through. We live in a democratic society. Specifically, we live in a constitutional monarchy. As a, an American citizen moving up here, it took me a while to get my mind wrapped around what does that actually mean, uh, that we have a queen and now we have a king. Uh, we live in the so-called West, uh, Western Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, North America in general. 
We live specifically in a time of economic challenge and political polarization. These are our days. And so if you've been around any length, you will hear me, uh, one of my favorite Old Testament texts, just a little one-liner in 1, Corinthians, 1 Chronicles 12, rather. It's the list of David's mighty men, and in the middle of it, you get this comment about the men of Issachar understood their times and knew what Israel should do. Just this one little comment, and I thought, you know what, that is critically important, that we need to be people who are both students of the culture and students of the word, understanding the times and then knowing what the people of, of God should do. Uh, a generation ago, a very famous evangelist that most of you will still remember the name, Billy Graham, of course. Uh, Billy was said that he would preach with a Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. Uh, I was going to go out today and try to find a newspaper, if they still exist, so that those of you under 25 would know what that is, but uh, it's how we used to get our news. Uh, that with the newspaper current events, so, or you might say your streaming platforms, uh, whatever social media and wherever you get your news, and then the Bible in the other hand. So we've got to be students of our culture. The opportunities and the challenges that we have are different today than they were obviously 50 years ago, even 20 years ago. Culture is changing quickly. And the reigning philosophies and ideology that rule our world about life and culture and right and wrong are, are not the same philosophies and ideology that our nation started with. And so how do we flourish as dual citizens? As citizens of heaven, which is our primary identification, but also citizens here on earth and needing to interact with the culture that we're in. Uh, do we just simply get angry? Throwing stones at everybody who's doing everything wrong that uh, we disagree with. Or the opposite extreme, do we hide away, isolate ourselves into a little Christian bubble and just kind of hunker down and hope that it all blows over? Or do we try to equip ourselves so that we could engage in a meaningful way in the culture around us as we are living here as exiles? And so if you're new to Northview in the last year or so, uh, those are critical conversations, and it's often what we will talk about on a weekend like this. Uh, if you stay around and you listen long enough, you'll hear statements like these, we exist to help people become deeply rooted followers of Jesus. That's our mission. Uh, it's Jesus' mission, go and make disciples. We happen to award it like this. Every evangelical church in the world has the same mission, and, and we've said we want to see people get their roots down deep deep into God's word, into doctrine and theology, that we would be good students uh, of what God has to teach us, and, and also deep roots into Christian community, knowing that you will not flourish, and I fundamentally believe this, you will not flourish in your Christian life without brothers and sisters in your life. And so the roots in the word and also the roots in the family, in the community. Uh, we also talk about wanting to see a healthy local church within reach of every Canadian. That is a big goal. It's a goal way beyond any local church. Uh, we want to do our part. We want to plant churches here in the Fraser Valley. We want to partner across our province in British Columbia to see revitalization of dying churches, planting of new churches. And we are constantly on the lookout for partners all across Canada from coast to coast, men and women who share our values, who are like-minded in theology and doctrine, who are leading people to Jesus, and we want to come alongside. And so that's a big part of what you will hear us talk about. We invest a ton of time and money in leadership development and, and church planning. Pastor Ezra, that's his entire job, is leading this multiplication end of our church. And then finally, I mean, there's layers upon layers of this. You will talk about, uh, you'll hear us talk about the three practices that we think every believer needs to lean into. The gather, the grow, and the go. And the, and the gathering is simply this, that we gather, and that is an upward focus, we gather together to lift our eyes, to refocus again, to put Jesus up, to lift him up, to get our eyes on him, to sit under the teaching of the word, and to have our lives uh, on a regular basis, Lord willing, on a, on a weekly basis, maybe in a small group, maybe in a large gathering like this, but we gather with God's people knowing that we've got to get our eyes again on the king. We, we want to grow. Uh, the personal life disciplines of getting your, your roots down, as I've talked about, maybe Bible studies, community groups, your personal devotions, and that inward growth. You have received Christ Jesus as Lord, Colossians 1 says, Colossians 2 rather. Now continue to grow in him, rooted and built up in him. And then finally, the going, of course, is the outward focus, uh, that we know, yes, we gather, but then we walk out those doors, we scatter 
And we scatter into the 24 sevens. And, and I'm a big believer in this, that as you walk through those doors, you're scattering back to your ministry. The ministry of your 24 seven in the marketplace, in the school, in the neighborhood, in the sports field, wherever you do your life, that we come together to get our eyes on Jesus. And then we scatter to take that message out to the world. So you'll hear us say all those things. And all of the above are very interesting and critical conversations. But if you had to know just one thing about who we are, what we're on about, what we do, what would that one idea be? Is there a key that unlocks what Northview Church and what every evangelical church truly should be about? And I think there is. So most of you will know the story of a chunk of rock called the Rosetta Stone. Uh, so back in 1799, some of you remember that really well. Napoleon had invaded northern Egypt, and his armies were digging through the rubble of a little city called Rosetta. Uh, the city had been destroyed, and they needed to build a military fort, and so they were digging through the rubble to find any stones that were usable to build now a new fort. And in digging through that rubble and rebuilding, one of the soldiers comes across this stone and immediately recognizes there's something special about this stone. He didn't know these languages, but it is very clear that these were man-made etchings in this stone. This was something important. We better not use this to form the foundation of the new fort. And they set it aside. And to make a long story short, over a number of years, as it began to be studied and deciphered, what they discovered is that there are three ancient languages on this text, and it was a key to unlocking the studies of Egyptology. Because on this stone, there are three languages. There is the Greek language, there is the, the local dialect of that particular region, and then there is Egyptian hieroglyphics. So if you know your history a little bit, the Egyptian language was lost. So as the, uh, the tombs of the, the pharaohs were being uncovered, as the discoveries in, in the pyramids and all of ancient Egypt and the hieroglyphics, whether etched in stone or on the walls of a cave, it was unreadable because that language had been lost until this stone came up. Because what happened was that the Greek language was still known. You see, what's written on the stone is really irrelevant. It's actually the announcement of a new king. It was etched in 196 BC. So a new king has taken the throne, and this is a decree about this new king. Who really cares about the decree? It's the languages that matter. The Greek language they understood so they could compare letter to letter, and so they decipher the alphabet of Egyptian hieroglyphics. It became the key, the stone that unlocked that language. Might there be a Rosetta Stone for the Christian faith? Might there be one key concept that if you understand this concept, it is able to unlock the whole of the Christian faith? And I believe there is. And it is this concept that sets Christianity apart from every other world religion, every other philosophy or ideology that drives humanity. And it is this central idea that God in Christ Jesus accomplished for us what we cannot accomplish ourselves. That God in Christ Jesus accomplished for us what we cannot accomplish ourselves. And if you want it in just one word, we call that message the gospel. The gospel. And it's a message that changes our lives and it changes our world. Uh, and so at the macro level, we could literally talk about the story of the universe. And although the, the meta-narrative language postmodernism is trying to get rid of that language, there is a meta-narrative, a, a, a storyline that arcs all of human history from the very beginning to the, to the end, the universe, the cosmos. And we would divide it. We would talk about these four chapters, the creation of that universe, and then the fall of that creation that was triggered by Adam and Eve's sin in the garden, uh, the story of redemption, and ultimately the story of restoration. And we would say to people, you know what, there's only two chapters in the Bible, four chapters rather, that describe life as it should be. Uh, Genesis 1 and 2, and then you go to the very end, Revelation 21 and 22. You've got four chapters that tell us what the world should actually be like. And everything else in between is God's story of trying to get us back to the original glory that he created us for. That's the macro, cosmic story, if you will. 
We personalize it and we individualize it when we say to people, you know what, the personal gospel, you need to deal with these concepts. You need to talk about who is God, who is man, as we understand humanity, uh, what is the story of Christ, and what is our response. And so those two stories are coupled together. The gospel is both the macro story of creation, that, that God is in the business of restoring all things, Colossians says. That all disease and sickness of humanity, yes, but even the very terra firma on which we walk. Have you thought this through? The creation itself, that the book of Romans says the creation is groaning. It is subject to futility, not because of its own sin, but because of the sin of humanity. The creation was cursed, and so every natural disaster, every earthquake, every hurricane, every famine, all of that, the earth is groaning, longing for a coming day of restoration, and God promises a day of restoration is coming for the earth. Amen? The gospel is also, of course, very personal. It is the story of our salvation. That God created us, but he also saw our rebellious hearts. He knew that we couldn't fix our own mess, and so he takes it upon himself to do what we can't do. And the question of humanity, of course, when you have those quiet moments and you ponder and you get alone with your own thoughts, you begin to ask, how can I face the sin in my own life? How do I deal with the shame from where I've been and what I've done? Is there a path for freedom for me? Is there forgiveness that is possible? Can somebody help me when you're honest with yourself? And there might be no more concise definition of the gospel than when Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 these words. So you can follow along or look at the screen. Now, I would remind you, brothers, brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand, and by which you're being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with with the scriptures. Now we'll pause right there. He goes on then to talk about over 500 people who saw Jesus and the rest of the chapter goes on to be a defense of the resurrection. But if you read Corinthians in its entirety in one setting, and that would take you a bit of time, it's 16 chapters, but it, it's not a long read, you will get the overarching sense of Paul's burden for this particular congregation. The church at Corinth was one of Paul's most frustrating churches. Uh, it's a congregation that is riddled with problems that stem primarily from one core issue, from their spiritual immaturity. And so all the way through this book, you will hear Paul calling and saying to them, in essence, I wish you would just grow up. I wish you would just grow up in Christ, that you would act like mature adults in the faith. But because you're acting worldly, you're acting childlike, you're acting like carnal believers, I can't speak to you as mature. And the letter is filled with strong rebuke and some very spicy topics. It's going to be a fun study. Divisions in the church. I've got my favorite teacher, you've got yours, who's the best? Immaturity, worldliness, this is manifested in sexual immorality, in literally legal battles between brothers in the church, the abuse of spiritual gifts, the confusion about the complementarity of men and women. Even the Lord's table has become a place of division instead of a place of unity. This church is a hot mess. But at the end of the letter, we get to chapter 15, and Paul concludes his thought, I think with this thought in mind, it's been really interesting to write this letter about all of these important topics. But before I close, I need to remind you of something very important. Let me remind you of the most important topic. All of these other topics are critical and they're interesting and we'll deal with them and he dealt with them. But he closes the book the same way he opens it. There's like bookends in Corinthians. Uh, chapters 1 and 2, the centrality of the gospel. You go to chapter 1, 17 and chapter 2, verse 2. For Christ did not send me, Paul is saying, to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Just pause there. He does go on then to say, I did baptize people, 
But that's not the primary reason why I came. The Lord sent me primarily to preach the gospel and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And then the next chapter, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The centrality of the cross. Now we get to chapter 15 and he's like, let me remind you of what's most important. And in those opening words, we get the Coles notes on Paul's message, the message of the cross, the message of Christ crucified. It was a message that was ridiculed as being foolish, as unsophisticated, as offensive. In fact, it's one of the key issues that separates Islam from Christianity. Because Islam does not believe that Jesus actually died. That he was crucified. If he was crucified, somebody swapped him out before he died. He was never buried. He simply ascended into heaven. So certainly there is no resurrection. This central teaching of the cross of Christ is is one of the distinguishing factors between Christianity and Islam. And so what I want to suggest to you today is simply this, that the gospel is the key. It is the Rosetta Stone to the entirety of this book. In fact, it is the entirety of this book. The gospel is the key to understanding our individual needs, and problems? Can someone fix my pain? And it is the key to understanding the story of human history and actually the story of the cosmos itself. The clear design and beauty, the fine tuning of the universe, and as we see the unraveling and the decay in the environment around us, and the question that we are asking is, can this world, will this world be renewed and restored? And so as we jump into a new ministry year, I can't think of a better place for us to start than with the first nine words of 1 Corinthians 15. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel, of the gospel. So we're going to look at the gospel in this text in three ways. What the gospel is, what the gospel does, and thirdly, what the gospel says. Very simple. What the gospel is. Simply, the gospel, that word understood, if you don't know what the word is, it simply means message. It is news. So in verse 1 and 3, which we read, Paul will say, it's the message that I received from the Lord. I delivered it to you. I preached it. And you, in turn, received it. It is news. It is a message. And verse 3 says, and it is a very important message. It is of first Importance. In other words, get this right and everything else will eventually fall into place if you get this grid of the gospel correct. And so whether you divide the chapters into creation, fall, redemption, restoration, or God, man, Christ, and response, either way, we start with the story of scripture. We start with God. A biblical worldview is this foundation, the first four words of the Bible in the beginning, God. That's where both these meta narratives start. Uh, it is a statement of faith that bumps up against the reigning ideologies of naturalism and existentialism and materialism that say there is no spiritual realm, there is no God, only the material world is really, only what we see in the natural world is real. And yet the scriptures say, no, 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 in the beginning, God. There was an uncaused cause. There is a reason behind the universe. And the answer to our unanswered questions, the cure for the longing in our heart in those quiet moments when we're like, is there any meaning or purpose to this life? Who are we? Why are we here? What is the human creature all about? Is our life just a mist, which we know it is, and it vanishes and we die and we are no more? There's no meaning ultimately to our life. Or is there a greater story? And the gospel is that story. Now that word gospel, I want to just dig into this because if you don't know this, it's the Greek word, and I don't put this up here to impress you with the knowledge of Greek because my computer told me this. The Greek word euangelion, which we transliterate into our English language, and we have a lot of English words that are that Greek word. So when you see the English word evangel or evangelism or evangelical, you can see it right there. It is a transliteration of the Greek word. If it is translated, it simply means it is a message. It is new. So we use this phrase, we claim to be an evangelical people, a people of a good message. We could also say we are people of good news. That equally fits the description. Good news, a message, a declaration. Uh, Matthew 4, Jesus, when he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and here it is, proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming it. It's a message. 
I'm going to stick on this for a moment because some people get confused about how do we preach the gospel because the gospel at its core is news that must be proclaimed. It must be spoken. It must be declared. It must be preached. Uh, The New Testament formula is you hear it, you receive it and believe it, and you are saved. You hear it, you receive and believe it, and you are saved. And so I want to put up a very famous quote that some of you may have heard. It's always attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. Have any of you heard that quote before? Now, I need to tell you that that quote is wrong on two fronts. It is wrong because scholars who have dug through all of St. Francis' sermons, and it's amazing that he would say something like this because he was an incredible preacher. In all of his writings, in all of his journals, in everything that's recorded, no one can find that statement anywhere that he said it. So there's no footnote for the statement. But secondly, it is fundamentally wrong because the gospel cannot be simply displayed. It must be declared. So Dwayne Lifton, who is the uh, president emeritus down at Wheaton College, says this, it's simply impossible to preach the gospel without words. The gospel is inherently verbal, and preaching the gospel is inherently a verbal behavior. You see, a lot of people say, I'll just live a good life. I'll just preach Jesus with my good deeds. Well, there's a heck of a lot of good people in this world that are living good lives for any number of reasons. Are they too preaching the gospel? In fact, there's probably people who live better lives than you live. Is their gospel better than yours? It must be spoken. Paul would say to the church at Rome, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then he goes on in the next verse to say this, okay, how are they going to call on the one that they've never believed? And how will they believe in him if they've never heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? So I'm putting a fine point on that because the gospel is a message. It is news. That God in Christ Jesus accomplished for us what we cannot accomplish ourselves. It's a message we've got to get to the world. What does the gospel do? What does the gospel accomplish? And so in the simplest of terms, we would say, well, sinful humanity is reconciled to a holy God. It's great. But if you mine the depths of the scriptures and you study into doctrine and theology, you will see that the gospel is rich and deep and wide, and there are so many angles and facets to the gospel, you will never mind the depths of the gospel. So I I like Jared Wilson's little book called Gospel Deeps, and in that book he talks about the Asians of the cross, not the stations of the cross, the Asians of the cross, and he lists out eight of them. Uh, Number one, mediation. That Jesus bridges the gap between God and man, that there's one mediator between God and man. I don't need an earthly priest. I don't need to pray to a saint. I can go directly to God through Jesus Christ. There is one mediator, and he is that mediator, Jesus. There's no condemnation because Jesus steps into the place of the condemned. He sets the condemned person free. There is propitiation. Now, there's a word that we don't use an awful lot today. That Jesus took our penalty. Uh, What that term says is he drank down the cup of God's wrath. That God's justice was satisfied in Jesus' perfect sacrifice, justification. Simply that God legally declares us to be righteous. And then the next word is beautiful. Imputation. This is a beautiful one. Not just that our sins are forgiven, clean slate, but that the righteousness of Jesus is imputed, reckoned, given, credited to our account. So in other words, what it means is when God looks at you, he doesn't just see you as a forgiven sinner with a white, clean slate. When he looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus. Is that not good? Uh, I'm covered over with a robe of righteousness that Jesus gives to me. And, And when the Father looks at me, he sees not what I used to be, but he sees Jesus because it's imputed to us. Expiation, this is also a beautiful, beautiful word. We're clean. We're clean. We're forgiven and we're free as far as the east is from the west. Infinity, in other words. 
He has taken my sin away. I'm free. He's washed me. He's cleansed me. He has expiated my sin. Sanctification, the ongoing work of the Spirit, and reconciliation, which is a beautiful word, that we're reconciled to God, the vertical axis, because of what Christ did. And because we're reconciled to God, then it opens the possibility for the horizontal axis that we can then be reconciled to one another. And here's where the gospel gets really good. Because if we really believe this, then all of the problems of the world are solved at the cross. Because if we could get 8 billion plus on the planet to get things right this way with the Lord, the opportunity for horizontal reconciliation opens immediately because I am reconciled to my father and I want to be reconciled to my brothers and sisters. This is good stuff. So mining the depths of the gospel and its impact will never grow old. But specifically in this text, Paul anchors the gospel to those two primary works. I would remind you of the gospel in which you stand and by which you are being saved. He anchors it to two things, justification and sanctification. Number one, you can take your stand on this truth. You are justified. It's as though you walk into a court of law and you pick up a guilty verdict that a just and righteous judge has written. Every sin of your entire life, the past, the present, and the future, is all there in a legal brief, and written across it is the word guilty, and then the judge takes and writes across that guilty verdict in blood-red ink paid in full. Declares us to be righteous. You go, where do you get that? Well, go to Colossians 2 that he canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, court of law. He set it aside, nailing it to the cross. What a beautiful metaphor this is, that as Jesus is walking up the road to Calvary, he's carrying this heavy legal brief with all my sin, this guilty verdict, and he goes to the cross and he pounds the nail into it, nails my sin to the cross and says, paid in full, amen? This is beautiful. Oh, Corinthian church, I wish you could stand on this. Riddled with so many problems because of your spiritual immaturity, how I wish you'd remember the most important things, that in Christ you can stand firm. And of course, the enemy of our soul doesn't want this. Colossians, or Ephesians 6, rather, be strong in the Lord. And in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand, there's the very same phrase, against the schemes of the devil. He will do everything in his power to deceive us into believing that we are not secure in Christ, that we have not been justified, that there is yet something more we must do. So Martin Luther, who was very famous for his battles uh, with spiritual oppression, later in life as he's gaining victory, writing to a younger guy that he is mentoring, and he says to him, you know what, when the devil throws our sins up to us and declares that we deserve death and hell, we ought to speak thus. So you speak to Satan in this way. I admit that I deserve death and hell. What of it? Does that mean that I shall be sentenced to eternal damnation? By no means, for I know one who suffered and made a satisfaction in my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Where he is, there shall I be also. And then he adds, or I add, so get lost, Satan. We take our stand here. Though Satan should buffet, the trial should come. Let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and shed his own blood for my soul. Oh, my sin, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. It is well, it is well, it is well, it is well with my soul. You know that song. Let me remind you of the gospel in which you stand and by which you are being saved. Sanctification. So salvation is talked about in the scriptures in three tenses, past, present, and future. This one is a present tense. It is rightly translated, you are being saved. Now, when someone asks you, when were you saved, you can actually say 2,000 years ago. Because signed, sealed, and delivered, when Jesus stretched out his arms, and in one word, to telestai, it is finished, he meant it. It is done. Everything that needed to be done to purchase our salvation was complete in that moment. It is finished. My sanctification, my justification, it is all signed, sealed, and delivered. And yet, 
I am being saved. That God takes me as I am, but he is not content to leave me there. And in this life, he continues to knock off the rough edges and sanctify me. And ultimately, future tense, we will be saved. We will stand before him in the new heavens and the new earth, salvation complete. What the gospel is, news. What the gospel accomplishes, it justifies and sanctifies. And then finally, what the gospel says What is the message at the core of this multifaceted truth? And Paul picks the key truth in this text. Let me remind you of the gospel story that Jesus was died. He died. He was buried. He was raised. And in the middle of that sentence, he adds these three words. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died. And then he adds these words for our sins. And in those three little words, he is pointing to the Rosetta Stone of the scriptures. If you want the key to unpacking, to understanding the gospel and the Christian faith, it is in these three words that go to the heart of the Christian faith, the core of orthodox theology, that God in Christ Jesus accomplished for us what we cannot accomplish ourselves. That he died for us. He died for our sins. He stepped in to take our place. If you want the big theological words, the words are substitutionary atonement. Atone. How do you make right with a holy God? How are you at one with God? Well, God will allow a substitute. And it is what sets Christianity apart from every other world religion. Because you ask every other philosophy, every other ideology, every other religion, whatever your philosophy is, how does one get right with a God as you understand your God? How do you atone for the wrongs that you have done? How can I, as a sinful human, stand in the presence of a holy God? Ask that question, and every religion will give you the same answer. Here's your list. Do these things and don't do these things. And hopefully you might, you can, maybe, hopefully will earn the favor of God. Hopefully at the end, your good will outweigh your bad. So Islam has its five pillars. Buddhism has its eightfold path. Judaism has its law. And yet the lists are strikingly similar. It's on you. Live a good life and God will approve of you. Christianity is the only faith that answers that question in an opposite direction. When you ask the question, how can I be made right with God? How can I atone for my sin? How can a sinful person like me stand in the presence of a holy God? What can I do? The shocking answer of the Christian faith is this. You can't. You can't. You're like, how is that helpful to me? It's impossible. It cannot be done, humanly speaking. You cannot pray enough, give enough, serve enough, love enough to pay off the infinite debt against a holy God. And so God, in his infinite mercy and grace, says, you know what? What's impossible for you to do for yourself, I have already accomplished on your behalf. I will allow a substitute to take your place. Amen. Woo! So someone has said, religion tells us what we must do, and Christianity tells us what Jesus has done. So J.I. Packer, a longtime prof out at Regent, a great evangelical Anglican brother, wrote so much good stuff over the years, condensed the gospel down to just three little words, God saves sinners. And he's like, you know what? You can write volumes on every one of those words. You can talk about the triune God, how the Father elects and how the Son redeems and how the the Spirit renews us. You can talk about the salvation plan that he planned it from the beginning. He achieved it. He calls us. He justifies all that. That sinners, guilty, vile, and powerless. You can describe all these words, but those three simple words say it all. God saves sinners. And so Paul is saying, as I wrap up this letter, let me come back to the most important topic of all. Let me remind you, brothers and sisters, of what is of first importance. And and so of all the topics that we could talk about as we jump into another ministry year, as we talk about strategies for more and better disciples and more and better leaders and more and better churches, all that great stuff, there is nothing more important than this topic. This message is, in fact, the only reason our church exists. 
The mandate given to us by Jesus was to take this message to all of the world. And, and so as we walk out those doors and into the 24 sevens, we go out on mission with the praise of God on our lips because we've been with the family of God and with a determination to tell a different story and to stand tall in the midst of our culture and, and to enter into conversations to go, you know what? Our world's a mess. I agree with you. It's a rotten mess. Did you know it wasn't always like this? Did you know it one day won't be like this anymore? What, what are you talking about? Uh, let me tell you the big story of the universe. Let me tell you how it began and how it will end. We go praying, oh Lord, you know the people that I love. You know the ones who are currently far from you. You know my friends who used to be part of a church and no longer. You know the ones who got hurt by somebody, the ones who just drifted away. You know the people I know and love who right now are actually full-on rebellious against you, shaking their fist at you, and they know better, and they're running away. And Lord, you know the impossibility of me arguing them back to the kingdom, so Lord, would you do the work that only you can do? Would you soften their hard heart? Would you heal their broken heart? Would you warm up their cold heart? And then, Lord, uh, it's not just my friends. It's me too. Because you know, Lord, how easy it is for my heart to grow cold, to get spiritually lazy, to take all of your blessings for granted. Oh God, would you do a new work in me? A fresh gospel work in me? Would you protect me from the evil one? Would you cause me to delight in your goodness, your blessing, your steadfast love? Would you, Lord, would you by your spirit give me this gift that the first thought every morning before my feet hit the ground, my first thought would be, good morning, Lord, what do you got for me today? Would you give me that gift, Lord? Remind me what you saved me from and what you're saving me to. So Paul would say, let me remind you the gospel in which you stand and by which you're being saved, that God in Christ Jesus accomplished what we can't accomplish for ourselves. And of course, the only question then that remains is, uh, will we receive the message? Will we say yes? And you need only to say yes. Enter into a lifelong journey. I see it, I hear it, I understand it, I agree with it, and I surrender my life. And there are likely some here this weekend who need to say yes for the very first time. You've never done this before, and there are others of you who need to say yes for the thousandth time. Yes, Lord, this is me standing in the need of your mercy. But eventually, we come to a point in our life where we realize, Lord, I recognize I'm powerless to fix my life, and I'm, I'm ready to receive this gift, but I need to tell you about this gift. Uh, one of the things that we study, it's a free gift given to us, and it will cost you everything. And you're like, wait a minute, uh, help me understand that. It's free, but it'll cost you everything. Yeah, that's right. God offers you his life, full and free. The only condition is you got to take your hands off. You got to get to the end of yourself and say, I've done enough mess in my own life. I'm ready, Lord, to take my hand off and to lay this life down on the altar as a living sacrifice. And maybe even this weekend, you need to do that anew and afresh. And maybe you need to do it for the very first time. So would you stand with me in Central Abbey, East Abbey? Would you stand with us as well? I want to pray with you and for you. Our music teams will then come and lead us. So Lord Jesus... Uh, we are excited about another year of ministry. Uh, in some ways, it's just turning the calendar page. We're back to school and home. people are back from vacations. It's awesome. Lord, more than anything else that we talk about, we need to remind ourselves week by week by week, day by day by day, of this gift of the gospel message, that you did something for us that was impossible for us to do for ourselves, that we were hopeless, we were powerless, we were broken, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and that you did everything needed to reconcile us to our Holy Father. And so, Lord, I pray for the men and women, the boys and girls in our congregation. I pray that this message would land in their hearts. I pray that you would open the eyes and ears. I pray that this weekend will be a weekend of salvation for individuals who would say, yes, I need to get things right with God. And I finally understand I can't do it on my own, and I'm willing to give my life to Jesus Christ. In this moment, I'm saying, yes, Lord, I will take that gift that you offer. And then, Lord, for so many of us who have heard this type of message a hundred times in our life, and yet anew and afresh need to commit ourselves to say, oh God, let me never forget the benefits 
the blessings of your salvation. Would you restore to us the joy of the gospel, the joy of our salvation? And so we give you this year, we give you our lives, we give you our church, we give you our nation, we give you our city. We ask, Lord, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Under your glory and our joy, in Jesus' name, amen.